Joke time. All right. This is one of my favorites. This is an all-time favorite. And if you've heard it, just pretend like you've never heard it before. All right. And I want to read it because there's a few things. I, I've, I've given this, but uh, <clears throat> it just sounds better what they've got down here. So a mother went to wake her son for church one Sunday morning. When she knocked on the, the door, he said, I'm not going. And she said, well, why not? He said, I'll give you two good reasons. He said, one, they don't like me, and two, I don't like them. His mother replied, I'll give you two good reasons why you will go to church. One, you're 47 years old, and two, you're the pastor. I was, we, we, we had, uh, we had Jeff McCleskey this, uh, this weekend over in the house of prayer and then he met with the staff and, and, uh, you know, if you're familiar with Randy Clark, Randy Clark is the one who went and preached at Toronto after he was touched in a, in a service and then that whole Toronto revival that went on for over 10 years, services six days a week for over 10 years. And anyway, uh, Randy, Randy was, uh, and you've heard me tell this, Randy was uh, in a fast and he was discouraged and he was ready to give up. And Jeff hadn't seen Randy for a couple of years, he said, but I just, he said, I just uh, felt like I need to call him and tell him, encourage him to go because he'd, he'd went to this particular uh, speaker and got touched in that service. And so he calls him up at midnight. Randy said, you know, how's it going? Of course, pastor says, yeah. Randy says, oh, it's, it's going okay. And uh, he said, well, you know, I just felt like the Lord told me to tell you this, and, and you, need to go, you need to go to this Rodney Howard Ma- Brown meeting. And, and he said, well, it's, it's really not going so good. He said, you know what? He said, I can't expect God to show up at my church when I don't even want to go to my church. He didn't laugh. That's, that is, it, it was, and so he ends up going to Rodney Howard Brown's service and gets touched and uh and the rest is history but i just made me think of this you guys are you're a little tight i don't know (laughs) give you one more then by the time bobby arrived the football game had already started and the coach said why are you late he said i couldn't decide between going to church or going to the football game so i tossed a coin to see which one and the guy said, but that shouldn't have taken, you know, that long. He said, well, I had to toss it 35 times before it showed football. <laughs> okay. I, uh, Richard and I had talked, and I feel like one of the, one of the things that is our challenges as believers in this year and, and from, from now till when Jesus comes is learning who we really are, our identity. And we've talked about that lots of times and ways. And I felt impressed to, to go back and to do kind of a verse-by-verse a verse kind of thing because I want us to get that grounded in our hearts. But as I was doing that, uh, I, just, I just couldn't get there. You know, I just kept pressing, trying to, I don't know if you've ever tried to do something and you just can't, can't make it happen and the harder you try the worse it gets and so I was uh going before the Lord and saying you know what's up with this and and so I I felt like he he wanted to share some things that maybe a a preface to that um and hopefully we'll get really honest this morning and uh if you get offended then you need to go to Terry's class and learn how to to get unoffended and uh I'm going to make some statements, and I and I want you just to think about them. Um, the first one is, you can love people and not love God, but you can't love God and not love people. It doesn't work. Because if the Spirit of God's in you and you're loving Him, He gives you compassion for people. And and today I'm hoping maybe to put. The, allow the Holy Spirit to put a finger on some things maybe in our lives that sometimes we gloss over or we avoid 
maybe some truths or revelations that, that really need to go deep into our hearts. There is a big crisis in the body of Christ and its identity. But you can't know who you are without knowing him. Did that go up there? Okay. See, if your identity really, he, he's the one who created us, you've got to know him. Amen? And the better you know him, the better you're going to know yourself. How many of you have heard this? This is a psychologist named Brene Brown. Has anybody heard that? Okay. My daughter quotes this lady all the time. Chris Vallotton quotes this lady all the time. She's in Houston. She's a Christian, and she's done research for like 20, 30 years. And she said this. She said, the fundamental difference between individuals who lived wholehearted and those that don't or didn't, especially, she's talking about those who can have a healthy relationship or connect to other humans, even after addictions. The difference is those who believe they are worthy of love and belonging and those who do not. You know what? You can be a Christian and not believe that you're worthy of being loved. The reality is something different, but we can believe that. And when we believe that, we, we live a shell of what God has for us. And we react to people in incorrect ways, and we don't enjoy this life, and we don't get to know the one who died for us. I knew a fella who came across as kind of arrogant. And he would be around people and he would say things. And if you, if you were around him, you would think, this guy just looks down on you like you're worthless because <laughs> he's got his stuff all together. And one day I, I, I sat down with him and I was kind of hitting that thing, like, what's up with that? I, and then I asked him, I said, so what do you... What do you hear in your head? And what he said was, I hear how I'm not doing it right. And I get this mental picture of my mom standing over me when I was trying to play an instrument and her telling me that I didn't get it right over and over and over. There's a There's a passage in Luke 6.45 that says, For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. This, this fella ended up going into all different kinds of things, sports and other th hobbies, to try to be the best at something and achieve something, to, to achieve a trophy or a prize, or to be able to have the, the ability to say, I'm, I'm the best. Our identity is not wrapped up in what we achieve. And our identity is not wrapped up in our past. Luke 6.45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes a critical person who is born again, uh, a critical person who is born again, hears criticism. In other words, you ever been around any critical Christians? <laughs> you ever known any? You ever been one for a day or a moment or an hour or whatever? You know, but, but people who live that in a lifestyle, they're always, you know, talking negative toward people because what they hear in the here and what they have stored up in their heart is being critical about themselves. Hello? And, and, and sometimes because of things that have happened or things that were said years ago, what that comes out, that's, that's the abundance. But I, I, because I don't feel very good about me, now I may act like I'm just on top of everything and the sharpest thing since, since whatever, is I end up wanting to find what's wrong with you 
to kind of help me feel a little bit better about me. Right? Y'all, okay. This feels kind of mechanical. Okay, turn the person next to you and say, breathe. (laughs) Well, I find my place. I put on that also, if I go into my prayer closet and I don't come out changed, if I come out more angry and critical, then the person who I've been talking to in there is definitely not God. Now what happens, and we can all be susceptible to that, is that we, we end up, our mind goes to other things, and we're not connecting to the one who lives on the inside of us. Amen? Some of you are smiling. I hope that's a good thing. (laughs) Because, Because we receive our identity from Jesus. Amen? I mean, who we really are is how he created us and how he sees us. Now, our identity, I mean, we're all different. It's not like we're all clones. But we have that same nature, if we're born again, of God on the inside of us, and we have this relationship with him and how he sees us. He sees us as sons and daughters. Now, get your Bibles, and let's go to Genesis 1. I think Richard used this not very long ago. I I feel like the teacher in the fall that's going over the stuff that we went over last spring and we're reviewing it, but we're going to get to a different place than maybe what you think. Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish and of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. As Richard said, a lot of creeps. All right. Um, He said make man in his image, and and, and Richard's done a great job of of explaining that, but that idea of image is that when, how many of you have ever been to Washington, D.C.? How many of you have ever looked at the Lincoln Monument going inside? Well, when you look at that piece of stone, It carries the likeness of Abraham Lincoln. It's it's not him, but when I look at it, it makes me think of of Abraham Lincoln. Now, we were made in the image of God, and and his our identity is that, you know, when people look at us, his desire is that they see God. He, He made us like himself, our, our nature, our care, all of that at the very beginning was to be like God. Now, here's something that's interesting to me is God didn't create, God didn't create us because he needed, he didn't, because he needed us, Okay. Sometimes people look at others and they look at, I need you to make me happy. Sometimes in a marriage when it really goes south, what, you know, when you, when you go into that marriage thinking that person, his purpose or her purpose is to make you happy. <laughs> You're in for a world of hurt. <laughs> you know, because no person can make you, oh, they can bring good things in your life and all of that. But the idea here is that he, he wanted him. He wanted you. You were created not because he needed you to do something as much as he wanted you. Amen? Some of you don't believe that, but it's it's true. So, 
he takes this dirt, he breathes life into it, and if you think about where we've come from and where he's raised us to, he's fashioned us to not only be his servants, not only to be his children, but ultimately to be the bride of Jesus. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> Amen? I, I wouldn't have picked you for his bride. <laughs> I wouldn't have picked me for his bride. But our identity is, so, so when I, I look at myself and I, I think, is when God looks at me, he wants me. He just doesn't need me for a job to get some people saved or this or that. Or, you know, he has to love me. He wants me. He wants you. You're incredibly valuable to him. Yeah. Shift gears here just a little bit. I'm going to say some things, and if you don't, if I don't make sense, <clears throat> just say, bless him, Lord, <laughs> and come and talk to me, and I'll tell you what's in my heart, because there's some things that, that kind of went on. And sometimes Christians, charismatic Christians, were people are not, I mean, it's everybody, but, you know, I is one, so this is, I've got to pick on us. So, is that we're not necessarily great with relationships. To the point that we look at, we look at the Word of God, and we look for a promise in there to take care of a need that I have. Okay? Rather than, I look in the Word of God to know a person who I've given my life to. And it's, and it's completely different. Now, he has, he has things, he has promises and all of that, but it's, it, it can become where I, I take this promise and I stand on it, I believe it. I even, through the grace of God, I have faith for that thing to come about in my life but I'm disconnected from the heart of God, of knowing Him. Because I have this mentality, okay, He's put this out there, so I'm just going to grab this, and because and, I know He really doesn't want to hang with me too much. <laughs> you know, He's God, and I'm me. Rather than, when I look in that Word, am I, am I looking to find Him? In John 17, Jesus says something really interesting. And my. He said, we talk about eternal life. Basically, we say that means going to heaven, right? You got saved, you got eternal life. You're going to heaven. Woohoo! <laughs> it's a good thing. You know, it is. It's not a bad but, but Jesus says, this is eternal life. It's that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That's what eternal life is about. And if I believe that he doesn't really want to know me, then I'm not going to press in. And I'll hold God at arm's length and I'll hold his Bible, you know, just to take like, you know, a solution book for issues and things. And I won't take it to know the one. So that means that if I don't know the answer in the Bible for a problem, then I'm up a creek. <laughs> and that if situations come, I'm not going to go to him with them. I, I've got to figure this out for myself. And I've got to find the, you know, the answer and all this other stuff. And, and it's not this relationship with Jesus. Now, a lot of us, especially guys, we don't like warm, fuzzy stuff. We think that's kind of squirrely and, you know, all that. But, but he likes hanging out with us. And so, is this making sense? <laughs> it is in my heart. I'm, and I, I've, I've started reading the Bible. I'm old, you know. I, I, I'm a slow, slow learner. And, um, but that reality is becoming more real to where when I'm reading the Bible, I'm looking at more not, you know, we have these words that we read and we say, well, that's what Jesus did and this, blah, blah, blah. 
but it, it doesn't become real to me. It's like, am I looking in there? Well, okay, how do you heal that guy? What was on his heart? What moved him? What was, you, you know, do you ever ask questions when you read the Bible? Or you just, well, that's the word and whatever. So I'm going to give you a couple of those, and, and I, hope, I hope we get to where this makes sense. <laughs> okay, Luke 8. Let's go there. Luke 8. Let's see if I can find it on my little thing here. Now, it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. Sounds good. And he said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Okay. Cruise in on a Sunday afternoon, you know, just let's go the other side. And so they launched out. Sometimes the Lord says to you, let's go this way. Let's go do this. And it sounds good. But then a storm arises. It's like. The mother load's coming in. You know, God, what's going on? <laughs> but as they sailed, Jesus, being who he is, walking in peace and takes a nap. You know, it's okay. It's spiritual. Jesus took naps. <laughs> it can be one of the most spiritual things you ever do sometimes. You know, I... He fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water. The boat was coming over the sides, and they were in jeopardy. They were in trouble. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, hey, <laughs> we're drowning, man. You ever done that to the Lord? Hey, <laughs> I mean... It's coming this way, and it's coming that way, and like, what's up, God? Haven't we all? If you haven't, just wait. That blessing's coming your way. It's, it's going to be great. I get that way sometimes. You guys, you get that way? I get that way when I'm working on stuff sometimes. I mean, and you can hear, and, I, and I'm talking to the Lord, and I said, I need some help, Lord. Come on. Jesus. Janie gets that way with computers. She gets like, if it's 30 seconds and it's not doing it, I've been here for an hour and this thing will not, you know. So he says, we're perishing. And sometimes we talk to God like he doesn't know our problem. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. You were down there, you know. Let's see. Then he arose, Jesus, and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was calm. I don't want to get on tangents, but I'm telling you, there is a peace in the midst of it that only the Lord can give. And what you can't give what is not inside you, what you don't have. You can't give peace to a person. You can't have a really hard hearing God when you're not in peace. And the peace that's inside is not based on your surroundings. If you're looking for things to happen to get peace and joy, then you're, you're looking at the wrong, the wrong world. See, we're supposed to be motivated from the inside out. The more we have that identity, the more circumstances don't phase us. It's not that they're not hard, but there is a rest. There's a peace in the midst of that. So... Then he says this. Now, you ever think Jesus sometimes got hard? Are you afraid to say yes? <laughs> and he says, he said to them, where is your faith? Well, I, I think about that. We, we talk a lot, and, and it, it fits together in, in, in here, may not out there, but is that Jesus recognized the hand of the Father working, especially when he saw faith in operation, because he knew that faith came from the Father. Somebody just didn't, you know, grunt that out, just, you know, really get it. You, you can't, you can avail yourself to places to, to cause your faith to grow, but it is, the, it is the Father that initiates that. We want to take credit for it, like I've got great faith, you know, and all that, but it's the Father who allows us to have that. 
So when you look at Jesus sometimes, when he'd say, your faith has made you whole, the statement, he would engage that, he would declare that because he thought, the Father's there, he's doing this, and so I'm just going to agree with heaven. Okay? So, how can he chastise them about faith <laughs> if they didn't already have faith? He rebuked them. You know God rebukes Christians? If he doesn't, then if you can't take a rebuke from the Father, then you're, Hebrew says, you're an illegitimate child. I heard Jeff say that the other night. He said a little bit rougher than that, but, but I, that's right. So, so the question is, okay, they had faith, but they were up against this thing, and these were, these were fishermen who'd been out on that sea. Evidently, this was the mother load of storms, and they were full of fear instead of faith. Well, here's the deal. You know how people say, I've said it. I've got faith for this. But I don't have faith for this. i got faith for a headache. <laughs> I don't have faith for an arm growing out. Somebody, <laughs> You know, I've got faith for, you know, get my check next week. But I don't have faith to, you know, to tithe or to give an offering. I don't. Right? I believe with all my heart, and I hope this makes sense, is that, and you'd see Jesus doing this at other times and other situations, they've just seen a miraculous thing. They, a few steps later in the story, they don't have faith, and, and he gets on them. And, and here's the point. If I just have faith based on this piece of the Bible... Instead of faith in a person, and his name is Jesus. Does that make sense to you? And it's hard to have faith in him without knowing him. I'll never forget, I won't tell the person's name because some of you in this room know him, but there was, there was a time that the Lord put three guys on my heart. And I didn't know any of them very well. And I prayed for them for like two or three years. One of them has passed away. Uh, one of them somewhere else. But, but the Lord put it on my heart, and, and uh, I went to this guy's house. I'd never met him. And I come to a screen door, <laughs> and he looks at me, probably because, I don't know, I'm kind of scary. I think my grandkids look at me sometimes. <laughs> You don't realize how I don't realize how tall I am until I get next to somebody. I think I'm about normal, maybe a little short, but you know, I and and I look a little weird too, and I probably looked really weird that day. I don't know if I'd been working or what. So I go to this guy and I, and I just said, I, I forget the word the Lord gave me for him. I just said something about the Lord, you know, wants to do this or that or whatever. And he looks at me strange, and he, I never forget. He opens his screen door and he comes out. And he says, "Who are you?" Who are you? And I said, "Well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Leslie and Nathan's dad." And blah. and he said, "He said I know them, and I know what they're like, so I can trust you because I know what your kids are like." He didn't know me. But he knew my kids. He had a relationship with them, and it built a trust. The Lord Jesus wants us to know him. That's not just a cliche Christianese kind of thing. It's what this is all about. Because what happens if we don't um, is if I get in a difficult situation, And, and I don't have that scripture down, or maybe I didn't pray that prayer that morning, then my whole focus is not in him, it's in my doing, or, or, 
or this particular promise. Now, the promises are to reveal to us the nature of God and what he wants to do. I'm not, please don't do it that way, but, but there's something beyond that. I remember one time we were down in Flora at Janie's uh, brother's house, and they have, it's a Christian camp, and there's a big park and whatever. And Nathan was the same age as, they had a boy the same age. His name was Luke. And, you know, they were out playing and whatever. And a couple hours went by, and they didn't come back, and we went looking for him. And then two or three more hours went by, and we couldn't find him. And I'll never forget this, because you know how you get, <laughs> you know, your kids, are the, you know, they're the, they're the most important thing to you, you know, other than the Lord himself. And so you're, and, the, and, and this thought goes through my head, you didn't pray a prayer of protection this morning. So you've opened the door. You get what I mean? Rather than, do I trust this one? Who's not hinged on everything I have to say it just right. But I trust him because I know him. And I'm all for prayer. You know me. And and scripture says there's things that God puts in our heart to pray, to ask him for that won't happen if we don't. But there's something is is your trust, is your faith in him, or is it in a word that he said uh, in, in the Bible uh, or, or something somebody told you or your own abilities or, or whatever it is. In, in Sokin, we talked about a worldview. And the reality is your worldview is what, how you act, not what you say. You know, because when push comes to shove, how do you live? You can say, you know, I believe that the Lord wants to bless me and do whatever, but I'm not going to tithe because I'm afraid I won't have enough, and I don't do this, you know. He's so the reality is you don't trust him to provide for you. And it could be a world of things. I'm just using that as an example. I can say I know he loves me, but I live out of a place of I really don't think he does, and I don't think people love me, and I'm waiting for them to be nice to me to make me feel good rather than, man, I'm okay by myself. Me and God, we're good. Okay, that went over really big. I can see that. <laughs> let's, go to, let's go to Luke 8, just down the page there, Luke 8, 36. We're closing in. Luke 8, 36. <clears throat> Jesus, after that little boat ride and the exciting adventure, they go over, and the next thing they do is they run into a demonized guy. And Jesus casts out a bunch of critters. They go into other critters. And, and people, the, the guys that were taking care of the pigs... They take off to the town and tell everybody what's up, what happened. Well, you've probably been freaking out too, right? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus wants a relationship with you. Jesus does the supernatural stuff. You can't divide him from that. And so... It says, verse 36, they also had been seen it, told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. Because they all knew this guy. They tried to chain him up. They'd done all that stuff. He was the weird guy that you stayed away from in town. I mean, and he was not just kind of, you know, like a street guy. I mean, he was incredibly strong and incredibly, you know, in bondage. So then the whole multitude, isn't that something? Everybody wants to see a show. Everybody, you know, so they, they go out there, and the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes, they come out. But you know what? I can see these people are probably religious people. I don't know that they're heathens, though they might have been. But they say, they don't say, oh, my gosh, that is so amazing what you did. They say, hey, would you? Would you mind just leaving? <laughs> this is a little much for us. Then the, they asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, 
and got in the boat and returned. You know, sometimes the Lord will put you in places and there's things he'll do that are not necessarily comfortable. Usually the, the places where he moves the most powerfully is when you're uncomfortable, right? But be careful that we don't, you know, when something's a little strange, it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong because we, we like familiar to the point that even some, if people aren't flipping down on the floor and turning circles and all the other stuff, we think God's not here, he's not moving. And some people, if it's, if it's quiet, we don't like that, but we want this, but we don't want too much of this, you know. It's like, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Am I meddling? I don't know. But, um, so then he goes from there. He's went across this, this lake a couple times. So <laughs> he goes over there, and then he comes back. Now, here's the thing that's amazing. He comes back, and there, there's a guy that meets him who's a church leader, who's a part of the church that wants to kill Jesus and doesn't like him, who doesn't like the way he's doing things, and he's too nice, and he's too loving, and he's too, you know, signs and wonders. He's just too much. Everybody look at 840. Have I got it up there? So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Well, there's a good one. That's a great preaching. I never. If you wait for him, he'll come. <laughs> kind of like you build it, he'll come. But if you wait for it, most of us aren't willing to wait on him. And behold, there came a, a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at, his, at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had only a daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Many people don't get saved until their life has fallen apart. Because they didn't even want to talk about God. They don't, you know, you don't, they don't want to hang with those weird people, those Christians. Many people will, will talk about how healing and kind of put it down and don't hardly believe too much until they're the one with the sickness and disease or somebody that's close to them will. And then it's funny, they'll go to places that they wouldn't go before ex because the people they hang with used to believe just like them, but their belief isn't going to get them a mir a, the miraculous. Right? Um. I know there's there's some of us in this room, we've had people uh, make fun of us or not even want to be around us. But when when they had somebody in the hospital that was dying, they called us. I've had that happen lots of times. Before I was a pastor, I used to go to church and people didn't want to talk to me because I was I actually believe what the Bible said, you know, to a fault. And I'm not. I'm not exalting me. I just, just, you know. But those same people would call me and want me to go pray for their child. And they'll do the same for you. And Jesus just embraces this guy. He doesn't give him a, a lesson and he doesn't condemn him. He doesn't look down on him. Because he has this heart of compassion. One of the things that, that you get to know Jesus and you hang out with him, and I mean, really, he'll give you a heart of compassion. And you'll be drawn to people that you would just as soon run from sometimes, <laughs> you know, or people that maybe you had an issue with years ago, maybe that you went to school with them, they put you down, and they were the jock, and you were the nothing, and, you know, or they were the president of the class, and whatever, you know, and you feel kind of, Skip down to verse 49. My 
computer's dying. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, now see, Jesus recognized that this guy had faith because he jumped through all the hoops that would probably get him kicked out of being a leader by coming to Jesus. You, you know, going after Jesus will cost you. Sometimes it costs your friends. Sometimes it costs other things. But, but he sees it, and, he, and so he's, he's in agreement, and he has this compassion for him as well. And then Jesus, he hears the same word, and he knows what's going on through this guy. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, don't be afraid. Only believe and she'll be made well. Now, here's the picture. I, okay. Here's the picture I get. Okay, Jim. <laughs> okay, Zena. You can be over here. So Zena's the person. Here, you face them, not me. <laughs> so Zena, and pretend like you're whispering in his ear. She comes to him and she and says, listen, your daughter's dead. Don't, don't bug the teacher. Don't bug the rabbi. Okay? Now, I want to see, can you make a fearful face? <laughs> that doesn't look very fearful. I don't know. But anyway, so, so you see, you know, Jesus sees that. And Jesus, I, to me, I look at him like Jesus getting his attention, looking at him. And he said, don't be afraid. Just believe. You, you can sit down. Thank you. Jesus, the more we know him, the less fear is in our life. It doesn't mean that when you get in situations and he speaks something to you or the problems get really big, <clears throat> it doesn't mean that fear won't knock on the door or come in your mind. Faith is not never being, having that, you know, experience. Because it's really not faith unless there's something hard like that that you have to press through. Because if you can do it without faith, well, you know. So, but the point is, is I go ahead and make the right choice and I continue to believe and do what he says, obedience. Right? And the reality is, the more I understand that Jesus is as real as you and I, that he loves me and he thinks. When I went to Texas, I was around the gulls. <laughs> That's a trip in itself, right? <laughs> and we had this, we had this, we were talking one night, and here's Ben, and, and here's Judy, and Vince. Of course, Ben and Judy are doing most of the talking. But uh, anyway, they had all these Pearsolisms. Or Pastor Rayisms, you know, things I say that I don't even realize I've said it like a hundred thousand times. But, but he will, and one of them is he thinks you're the best thing since peanut butter. You know, he he loves you. It doesn't mean he won't talk straight to you. It doesn't mean that he won't rebuke. The rebuke or the correction is always to help you. But if you're so fearful and feel so unloved, Randy may come up to me and say. You know, Ray, I, 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 I think you didn't handle that. I think you should have done this or that. If, if my, my relationship, my identity is so low in the Lord, I'll get mad at him because he's pushing on a thing that is, it's, well, it's all about me. And if I'm not perfect and I don't look good and do everything, I, but no, 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 if, if I'm a son, I know that, then I want to do the best for my father. Right? And sometimes sons make mistakes. <laughs> sons, sometimes sons mess up. And sometimes sons are just ornery. You know, they're just. So I was going somewhere. <laughs> I think we're going across the lake one more time. Let's go this way now. But the more I know him, the reality is as I'm going through, he is with me. Literally, he's on the inside of me. Jeff did a great job the other night talking about that. And my faith 
is in this one that I love, who gave himself for me, who gave me at the, at the new birth a whole, I became the person that he created me from the beginning. I'm not becoming that per, I already am. I'm just learning who I am. Didn't realize. Didn't realize how he created me. That I'm, I'm so used to reacting in the old way that I still think that's who I am in the new way. Amen. Jesus goes on and goes with that guy, and you know the story, and Jairus' daughter, and he, he goes and he prays for her, and he, and he heals her. The Lord wants us to know him. The more I look at him, the more I become like him, that whole beholding and becoming. But so much of our culture, we're looking for identity in what we achieve and what people say about us on Facebook. Hopefully it's good. And did I get, did you get 35 likes? Did you get 102 likes? Did you get, you know, we, we are looking for what I drive, how smart I am, how much, how many people I healed, like you healed anybody. Yeah. How many people I led to the Lord? And yet the Bible says, it's the spirit that draws him to Jesus. I didn't, I was just, the, I was just the errand boy, you know, the delivery boy. I, I showed up with, you know. He wants that. He, he wants us to know him. And in that, we'll know who, who we are. And I, I, I challenge you to look in the Bible I challenge you especially for me I'm, I just, is reading the Gospels and looking at Jesus and seeing what he's like and allowing your heart to fall in love with him, to let him be the, the focus of your head and not your job or, or what's going on with your kids or all those things that we all, you know, we deal with them. In that place, we have peace. In that place, according to, to John, who was self-described as the one that Jesus loved. <laughs> I love that. I just think, of, yeah, I'm the disciple Jesus loved. You know, I'm the pastor Jesus loved. I'm, yes. But in, in John, he says, but that love relationship causes fear to be thrown out of my life thrown out of that situation. Christians sometimes, because they're not confident in him, are not confident in themselves. And they, and they operate in so much fear. Did I say it right? Did I do it right? Did, did, I, did I pray enough times? Did I, you know, um, do I have the answers? Do I have all, all those? What if, what if the theology goes off a little bit? What if somebody says that all that? stuff and fear is not motivated by the father it's not part of his kingdom amen okay i'm off for two weeks <laughs> as, as i close i'm gonna say a couple things and um i want to bring up and i hope she doesn't get mad at me but she's a good lady and she'll forgive me if she does but um Louise is having surgery this week. She's knee surgery. And I would just ask that you would, uh, that's on Wednesday, I'd ask that you'd lift her up. And, uh, and Pastor Don, um, that the surgery goes well, which it will, and, and she will recover. And some of the things she's been hampered with will, will be gone. And pray for patience for both of them. And... Um, they're, they're awful patient people. I don't know. Maybe you don't need, maybe they don't need any of that, but probably wouldn't hurt. And, and you know, if you, uh, you know, want to fix a dinner, 
so Pastor Don doesn't have to cook or, <laughs> or go to McDonald's. No. Uh, but if you just, just love on them, send them a card. Uh, you know, don't go out and bug them because, you know, when you're recovering, that you don't necessarily want people around watching you in pain and some of those things. But, uh, but if you'd like to drop something off or call them and encourage them, but, but above everything, pray for them. Amen? Because they are an incredible gift to four C's. Okay, Kathy. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. She does, I, I, and Kathy's good at that, and I appreciate her serving like that. Um, would you stand on your feet? I... I I pray in the in the days and weeks ahead with what's coming is that we get stripped for, away from any filters that we're looking through that we don't see things accurately. Some of us have some of those. And you know if I've got if I got a pair of blue glasses and you're talking about brown and green I can't, I can't hardly relate, you know? <laughs> and and to pull those off to where they can see things the way they really are. Yeah. If you're here this morning, I look around, I know most of you, but if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, it's the best thing you'll ever do. It is the best thing. You don't even know who you are or what you're about until you say yes to Him. And if you're here today and maybe... You haven't been walking with him, and you just feel like, you know, you're feeling a prompting by the Holy Spirit, and that's that's the Father speaking to you on the inside, and he's he's wanting to do something. So don't knock it. Go with him if he's speaking to you, and you, and you just it's like there. I, I just need I need to make a a decision today to come back to him and just serve him. Then. As we close, I'd encourage you to come up and let people pray with you and encourage you. Thank you, Lord. Anybody getting tired of standing? <laughs> you know God's funny too. <laughs> Can I one more thing? Say, preacher, do you really mean it? <laughs> one thing the Lord's in that fast that we had, one thing that the Lord made real to me, and, and I'm not saying I do it all the time, but it's it's in my head, and it's it's getting getting where it needs to be. Is when I speak to someone other than myself, or even myself, I guess you could say that too. But when I speak to someone else, especially, am I speaking the words of the Father? Is what's coming out his words? His words are not criticism. His words are not judging. His words are not, I'm really ticked at you. <laughs> but but scripture says that when we come together, what, what it should happen is that we should encourage one another to put courage in, to be, to help each other believe what's difficult for us to believe for ourselves, to remind us sometimes of what we already know. And, and I just, because it's real easy just to say, but here's the thing, when you speak the words of the Lord, and I don't mean quote the Bible, and that's okay, but an uplifting, talking about Jesus, talking about a person's destiny and, and their identity, it causes, it causes his voice to get magnified. It gets louder in our head. Because we've all experienced somebody saying something negative to us, and it's bounced around in there for decades. So we have that opportunity to speak life and encouragement, to put courage in. Amen? So let's grab hands. Thank you for your patience. I talked a long time. Thank you, Kurt, for letting me talk a long time. <laughs> so, Lord, I, I'm just, let, let's just pray for one another. I'm going to pray for everybody, but you pray for the person's hand you're holding. Lord, I'm praying 
for people to fall in love with you all over again, Jesus. I'm praying, Lord, for people that when we're in the Word, we're looking for who you are, Lord, to just experience, Lord, set ourselves up for another encounter with you, an another revelation. And, Lord, in the process, we're getting a clear picture. Jim had that word about clarity this morning. A clearer picture of how you look at us and how you see us. And we get to live out the, the life that you had from the very beginning. And we get to do it with you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would take us from, from a, a faith of just about some words in there, Lord, that are so true, they're eternal. But, Lord, to, to have faith in you, that we don't live paranoid and fearful. Lord, we get in situations and our confidence is not even in our faith. Our confidence is in you. Lord, I just thank you for that. I just bless you, Lord. And you said you had something you were supposed to do. I didn't forget. You thought I did. I know. You You thought you got off the hook. And, and you know, Ann's always running up here wanting to give words all the time. You know how she is. <laughs> and and there was another, I don't know what I did with that one. Did, I had you read that one of Kathy. Did, you didn't take it, did you? Okay. There. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you to do two things. Maybe you better sit back down. I don't know. Uh, would you read that? And then uh, this is a word from Kathy over there that she had before the service. And then Anne had something she felt like the Lord wanted us to do. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I, can all, I can read all but one word, so... Kathy, read, she writes in tongues like I do. I mean, you can't read it. You have to have an interpreter. Do you see my beauty? Look inside. Look inside, for that's who you are. I've resurrected you and redeemed you. You're my temple. Let's go off. Let's let go of stuff, the struggling, and look inside. I was really kind of hoping that Ray would forget, but... Because this is way outside my comfort zone, um, but go. It, it, and I think it goes along kind of with what <laughs> Ray has <laughs> been <laughs> saying. But and it's been in my heart for a while that that we would know ourselves the way we really are, the way Jesus created us, mm -hmm. and that is to be Christ-like. And I believe we're in a time when He's taking us into that, where He's revealing, you know, that we're learning more and more about who we really are, and. You know, if you've been around me very long, you've heard me talk about all the things we think we are that we're not. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I've always been very shy and very introverted. Um, and and so then I go in and I'm, ah, and then I go, you know, and then I'll go back and I'll think, oh, God, I'm such a phony, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because that's not me. And then I'm be beginning to realize that I think the real me is the outgoing, loving person not this introverted, won't talk to anybody or look them in the eye that I've thought I was all my life. So I think he's wanting to lead us all into that. Here's the part I thought he told me today, and that's that he wants us to do a prophetic act. That is, he's wanting to, for us to take him in and blow out everything that's not of him. And in that prophetic act is the only way we're going to become more like Jesus is to spend quality time with him not with our list which is what jeff talked about a lot not with our lists but with just getting to know him more and in that well there are lies that the enemy tells us and i think god will reveal those lies to us that we'll know that that's not who we are but we will become more like who we behold so today i believed he wanted us to do a prophetic act and if I'm wrong, nothing's going to go wrong. That's okay. <laughs> and that is I want us to all take a deep breath and breathe him in and in a minute. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you. I, okay. Uh, sound effects here. Sound effects. <laughs> and then blow out everything that's not of him. <laughs> so we're on the count of three. <laughs> One, two, three. Deep breath. <gasps> then blow him out. Everything else. <laughs> Amen. 
Go have a great day. I won't ask you to pray for whoever's playing the Patriots, but anyway, okay. <laughs> have a